Good afternoon, our dear students. I'm glad to meet you on my YouTube channel. Uh, and today we have a new lecture in the Department of Propedeptics of Internal Medicine. And this lecture for fourth year students, English speaking students, MA groups. Uh, and today we continue cycle of lectures from endocrinology. You remember that first sub-module in internal medicine on uh, fourth year I uh, have from endocrinology and today a fourth and the last lecture from this sub cycle uh, and it connected with diseases of hypothalamic pituitary system uh, okay let's start our lecture and before we start, as usual, I have several questions for your self-checking, for your self-work uh, about, uh, about uh, topic of our today lecture. As usual, this test from USMLE, uh, and as usual, it's your for, uh, for your work, for your more effective uh, learning of this topic. And if you are not ready uh, to answer at that time on that question, um, but you are interested in, uh, I recommend you to try to answer after the lecture, because all information that you need will be in lecture. Uh, and if you want, as usual, if you want to discuss, if you want uh, to detailize something, you can write in the comments under, under the video or on our Facebook page. Okay, test one for today. A 42-year-old man presents for a, a new family physician to establish care. According uh, to the patient, he has been healthy his entire life and rarely visits doctors, although he recently got married and his wife in, uh, insisted that he see a doctor at least once. He reports no past medical history or surgical history. His physical exam is notable for elevated blood pressure by 150 by 90, and the finding seems on future. Uh, okay, it's not visible here because of camera, but partly you can see it is some specific form of face. I will show you today's lecture uh, such changes. What will be the most likely cause of the death for this patient? And uh, options. Uh, respiratory disease, second, cardiovascular disease, third, malignancy, fourth, chronic kidney disease, and fifth, it is liver failure. Be attentive during lecture. If you don't know the answer, uh, this answer will be during uh, our lecture. Plan of our lecture. I am going to give a definition what is diseases of hypothalamic pituitary system. Uh, we will discuss epidemiology as usual, risk factors, possible etiology, mechanisms, classification, clinical presentation, diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, prophylaxis. And uh, as usual, on first slides, I show you anatomy for short reminding. If you don't remember the anatomy and physiology uh, of our pituitary gland uh, of hypothalamus, uh, and you need to uh, rem uh, some rem for some reminding for its anatomy position, for uh, nearest uh, organs and its functions, its regulations, uh, please return to the physiology because. In internal medicine without anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology, it is nonsense to learn something else. Okay, uh, uh, as usually, uh, let's start from definition. Uh, uh, the hypothalamus and pituitary form a functionally integrated complex. You know it from the physiology. Damage. To the hypothalamic pituitary system can impact the responsiveness and normal functioning of the pituitary and may cause inhibited signaling to the pituitary or decreased functioning of the pituitary leading to deficiencies of one or more of the following hormones and let I remember uh, the uh, hormones from this system. It is, th it is a thyroid stimulating hormone. You know this hormone TSH from the lecture from thyroid gland. Adrenocorticotropic hormone ACTH. We talked a lot about it in previous lecture. 
It is beta androphin, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, prolactin, and melanocyte stimulating hormones. Damage of the hypothalamic pituitary system may to uh, uh, may to cause excess pituitary hormone secretion, uh, or uh, all these hormones uh, due to damaging of this system uh, can lead to deficiencies, or it can uh, these damages uh, can lead to excess production of all these hormones with the different uh, symptoms and different diseases. Epidemiology. The breakdown of uh, disease distribution you can see on this scheme. You see that most often it is Cushing's, but here it is Cushing's disease or secondary Cushing. Uh, on second play, nearly the same, uh, the same often. It is non-functional adenomas of uh, pituitary or hypothalamus, most often pituitary. Uh, less often, nearly twice less, uh, it is craniopharyngioma, uh, and less often it is problems with growth hormone. It is uh, uh, retin cleft, it is uh, uh, chordoma, it is prolactinoma, TSH problems, uh, fibrous dysplasia, and other disorders that much more rare. Uh, and distribution by age. You see that more than uh, half of patients with problems of hypothalamic pituitary system, it is middle age adults. Yes, it is working able adults. That's why socially the problem of hypothalamic pituitary system it is quite important. Uh, less often uh, diseases of hypothalamic pituitary systems uh, affect uh, the teenagers and young adults under 25 and uh, from uh, 46 till 16. And children younger uh, 13 and younger and aged people after 61, uh, they are uh, affected from these disorders much more rare. Uh, and uh, according to uh, international classification of disease, you see codes and classification of uh, disorders of hypothalamic pituitary system. Now we, I'm going to talk more about classifications. Risk factors and etiology. You understand that um, most of these problems have no uh, a real cause, like uh, we are sure that we have uh, adenoma of uh, pituitary gland and uh, we exactly know cause of it. That's why here on the first place goes a risk factors. It is a factor that potentially, uh, uh, potentially, but uh, it is, uh, so, um, uh, we know that it is connection between these factors and uh, the manifestation of disorders. What risk factors for hypothalamic pituitary system? Uh, it is anorexia, it is bleedings, bulimia, genetic disorders, uh, different growth like uh, different tumors and head trauma. Uh, and you see here a very interesting photo. Uh, on this photo you can see uh, Xi Jinping from China and Sultan Qasem from Turkey. And it is the highest and the lowest human uh, in the world. And you see uh, they are to them together on this historical maybe photo. Uh, and what is interesting, by I included it in, in the lecture because uh, both of them uh, have problems of hypothalamic pituitary system. Today uh, you can understand what exact problems. Another disease, it is infections and swelling. Different inflammations of different localization can lead and can be a risk factor for hypothalamic pituitary diseases. It is malnutrition, it is radiation, surgery, and uh, hyperironemia. Uh, who uh, uh, does not remember physiology, please, uh, on this picture, it is short reminding you. 
uh, what is hypothalamus anterior pituitary link yes uh, what is the from what uh, arteries it goes blood supply and what hormones uh, go to the blood from anterior pituitary and their regulation uh, mechanisms commonly hormone deficiencies uh, may include from hypothalamic pituitary first it is gonadotropin deficiency involves luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone affecting in the reproductive system in men and women and menstruation in women tsh deficiency leads to secondary hypothyroidism you know it from the lecture from the about thyroid gland ACTH deficiency leads to reduction in the secretion of adrenal hormones resulting to hypoadrenalism. You remember uh, secondary uh, adrenal insufficiency from the previous lecture. Uh, growth hormone deficiency has a variety of different negative effects as different ages like in newborn infants it may be hypoglycemia and micropenis while in later later infancy and childhood growth failure is more likely for such children other hormone deficiency uh, prolactin deficiency lead to diabetes insipidus Multi and it can be multiple hormone deficiency. In a lot of uh, patients, we see deficiency of several hormone in one case. Uh, uh, generally, growth hormone uh, in such case lost first. Then, after growth hormone, follows luteinizing hormone deficiency. The loss of follicle-stimulated hormone TSH and ACTH follow much later. The progressive loss of pituitary hormone secretion is a slow process, which can uh, occur over a period of months or years. The loss of all pituitary hormones released by anterior pituitary gland we named with the term pile hypopituitarism or pituitary failure. Please remember this term. Uh, and here you see a photo. It is CT scan when you see a cutting with a very good visible uh, pituitary gland and it uh, connected pituitary tumors. They can, uh, pituitary tumors may produce excess hormones or, for example, they can block like they oppress the normal tissue of pituitary gland. Uh, they are non-functioning by their own, they not produce hormone and they press on the other part of pituitary gland and lead to deficiency. That's why pituitary adenoma uh, have, can have both results as toxic adenoma produce something and lead to excess of something or it non-productive and uh, according to obstruction of all other pituitary gland they can lead to deficiency uh, okay uh, international classification of disease uh, you see hyperfunction of pituitary gland and hypofunction of pituitary gland by a cause of e22 and e23 Clinical classification. Let's classify uh, according to clinical presentation what is usually the most important for us. First, it is pituitary adenoma, like uh, some uh, like some mass effect, uh, and uh, what mass effect they can cause. We will discuss. A next big syndrome it is hypopituitarism it is deficiency of some hormones of pituitary gland it can include somatotropin or growth hormone deficiency gonadotropin deficiency corticotropin deficiency or thyrotropin deficiency and opposite situation excess pituitary hormone secretion it is include prolactinomas acromegaly cushion syndrome or thyrotropin secreting adenoma uh, uh, non-functioning and glycoprotein secreting pituitary adenoma it is another specific types it is it can be a such inflammatory problem like lymphocytic hypophysitis 
it can lead to empty cell. I will show you what is it. Uh, another form, it is pituitary apoplexy or diabetes insipidus. Uh, okay, uh, partial list of tumor like mass effect symptoms. It is headaches and loss of vision. By it volume not connected with a hormone excess or deficiency, it can lead to headaches or loss of vision. Why loss of vision? I hope you remember the anatomy of uh, pituitary gland. Uh, I will show you it plays near the uh, optic hiatus and according to pressing on them, it can lead to some losing of uh, fields or at all losing of uh, vision. Uh, symptoms uh, of hypothyroidism, uh, they are the same if you remember hypothyroidism primary from lecture about thyroid gland. Uh, here we discuss secondary like according to deficiency of TSH from pituitary gland, but symptoms are the same. Let's remind, it is called intolerance, it is constipation, depressed mood, fatigue, hair and skin changes, hoarseness, importance, loss of body hair and muscle in men, mental slowing, menstrual cycle changes and weight gain. Uh, and uh, partial list of low adrenal function symptoms. In most uh, you remember previous lecture, it is adrenal insufficiency and it can be central to it, can go from pituitary gland and deficiency of ACTH hormone, but in secondary case here uh, the most often such non-specific symptoms like dizziness and weakness. Uh, partial list of other symptoms. It is body temperature problems, it is emotional problems, uh, excess thirst, obesity, uncontrolled urination, Kalman's syndrome, you remember it is type of hypothalamic dysfunction that occur in men and include lowered function of sexual hormones like hypogonadism and inability to smell. Uh, and uh, pituitary conditions, one more time, schematically uh, on this uh, slide, you see that uh, they can include vision impairment, weight gain or loss, nipple secretion, loss of libido, sleep disturbance, large hands and feet, excess urination, blood pressure, irregular period, growth failure in children, depression, fatigue, joint pain and fat cell changes. It connected with different hormone uh, who are, uh, are attentive on my lectures and active uh, on practical classes can can different what uh, symptoms are connected with what hormone problems and in general uh, tumors effect like mass effect uh, can include several dangerous symptoms uh, that are in general in this scheme uh, can uh, help you to diagnose in some person uh, tumor uh, in the brain what is that? It is most usual vomiting, mood swings, cognitive decline, hearing problems, headache, speech problems and seizures. It is the most dangerous symptoms and you can use this scheme in your future practice and uh, uh, you can use uh, this scheme in communication with other people. Uh, people, if you see even not in practice uh, the people with such symptoms spontaneous without uh, any significant cause, first of all you have a uh, suspect uh, some brain tumor. Is it connected with pituitary, not connected with pituitary, but these symptoms are danger for brain tumor. And for today, uh, for you, for your self-block test two. A 67-year-old female presents with complaints of fatigue, nausea and headache that have developed over the past several weeks. Her past medical history is significant for hypertension, diabetes mellitus, chronic heart failure and small cell lung cancer diagnosed and treated three years previously. 
Vital signs uh, are as follows. Temperature 37.3, heart rate 82, BP 142 by 86, respiratory rate uh, 16, saturation uh, 97 on room air. On physical exam, peripheral edema is absent and she is alert and oriented to person, place and time. Abnormalities noted on initial lab work include glucose on level 138 mg per deciliter and sodium 122. Follow-up testing reveals a urine osmolarity of 310 and serum osmolarity of 268. Uh, uh, urine uh, and creatinine levels are within normal limits. Which of the following is the best, best next step in the management of this patient? Uh, who has no idea? Uh, it is small help for you. Remember previous lecture. Okay, options. First, uh, democlosiline uh, administration. Second, initiate desmopressin nasal spray. Third, fluid res uh, restriction. Fourth, hypertonic saline infusion. And fifth, lithium carbonate administration. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about pituitary tumors because it is uh, most often, uh, you remember from epidemiology, it is adenoma, the most often case. Pituitary adenomas. They can uh, be like microadenomas when it is less than one centimeter or ten millimeter, and macroadenoma when it is bigger than one centimeter. Uh, these adenomas arise from adrenohypophyseal cells and are uh, almost always benign. Pituitary adenomas discovered by CT or MRI examination, even MRI a little bit more better. In the absence of any symptoms or clinical findings, are referred to as pituitary incidentalomas. It is asymptomatic adenomas. Pituitary adenomas are rarely associated with parathyroid and neuroendocrine hyperplasia or neoplasia as part of the multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 or MAN1 syndrome. Pituitary uh, carcinomas are extremely rare, but metastasis from other solid malignancies like mainly breast and lung can occur. Signs and symptoms of pituitary adenoma. Pituitary tumors can manifest within signs and symptoms of pituitary hypofunction or hyperfunction or mass effect, as usually what I told you. It can lead to excess of hormones, it can lead, according to pressing, to deficiency hormones and mass effect like tumor. Uh, in patchment of chiasma by pituitary tumor results in visual field defects most commonly be temporal hemianopia. Patients with cellar mass processing of the optic chiasma should have a Humphrey visual field test. Lateral extension of the pituitary mass to the cover nose sinuses and can result in diplopia, apoptosis or altered facial sensation. There is no specific headache pattern associated with pituitary tumors and in some patients the headache is unrelated to pituitary adenoma. Uh, and a short reminder, the position of pituitary gland, you see it lying uh, under uh, the chiasma, optic chiasm, and adenomas most often can press the chiasma in middle part, and you remember that in middle part uh, go nerves to the peripheral part of the, uh, of the eye, uh, leading to peripheral uh, visual field uh, defect, defects. What we are told, uh, what we call uh, bitemporal hemianopy. MRI. What I told, it is the best method of visualizing hypothalamic pituitary adenoma. Sometimes uh, it's uh, difficult to diagnose, especially microadenomas. Once a pituitary adenoma is found, it is necessary to determine its type. Is it secretory or is it not secretory? Is it produce some hormones or not produce? Uh, and determine a pituitary function. What with the function of other pituitary tissue? Wherever there is any visual field effects. 
The treatment of pituitary tumors include reduction or complete removal of the tumor, elimination of mass effect, normalization of hormone hypersecretion and restoration of normal pituitary function. Some patients with large tumors require additional medical and radiation therapies. The most important factor is in pituitary surgery is unavailability uh, oh, sorry, availability of an experienced neurosurgeon. Uh, here you see how look uh, pituitary adenoma on this uh, case. It is non-functioning pituitary adenoma that disclosed in patient with macroprolactin amelia. Uh, adenoma shown by arrow. You see this uh, big round. It is uh, macroadenoma and macroprolactin amelia. It produces prolactin. Test 3 for you. 34-year-old man with a history of major depressive disorders presents, presents to the emergency room with altered mental status. Vital signs are stable and he appears a eovolemic on exam. Serum sodium is 120. The patient's hyponatremia is attributed to newly prescribed fluoxetine. Which of the following is another cause of eovolemic hyponatremia? First, it is congestive heart failure. Second, nephrosis. Third, prerenal acute kidney injury. Fourth, mineral corticoid deficiency. Fifth, it is lung malignancy. Uh, okay, next syndrome, general syndrome that I won't discuss to you, it is hypopituitarism. What is that? Etiology. Pituitary adenomas are the most common cause of hip hypopituitarism, but other causes can include paracellular diseases, pituitary surgery, previous radiation therapy, uh, different inflammation, inflammatory and granulomatous diseases, and head injury. The sequential loss of pituitary hormone secondary to mass effect is in the following order. This order I explain you on etiology. In pituitarism, it goes first growth hormone, after it usually it is loss of function of luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, after it more uh, late TSH, ACTH, and last one it is prolactin. Isolated deficiency of various anterior pituitary hormones can occur. In general, pituitary microadenomas are rarely associated with hypopituitarism. Diabetes insipidus is almost never seen in patients with pituitary adenomas at presentation. Okay, isolated hormone deficiency. Let's discuss somatotropin deficiency or growth hormone deficiency. Uh, okay, uh, growth hormone deficiency is in premenopausal women is recognized early on account of amenorrhea, infertility or loss of libido. Men often delay presentation on developing importance or loss of libido through this wider recognition of effective management of erectile dysfunction. This pattern is reversing, provided other practitioners check for hormonal causes. Patients with growth hormone deficiency have increased body fat and decreased lean body mass, and they might have decreased bone mineral density. Growth hormone deficiency is evaluated by dynamic testing, including the insulin tolerance test or growth hormone releasing hormone. Uh, growth hormone releasing hormone in relation with arginine. Adult, adult growth hormone deficiency is diagnostically valuable and clinically important since recombinant growth hormone therapy is available. Uh, okay, you understand it is a simple thing that growth hormone uh, normal lead to normal high of the person if it is manifestation uh, it connected with children not with adults uh, it is too much growth hormone it is a very higher person and if it is deficiency of growth hormone it is uh, a low high person and the same scheme Okay, gonadotropin deficiency or hypogonadism. 
In women, hypogonadism causes infertility and oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea, often associated with lack of libido, hot flashes and dyspareunia. In men, hypogonadism is diagnosed less often because decreased libido and importance may be considered functions of aging. Osteopenia is consequence of long-standing hypogonadism and response to hormone replacement therapy. Hypogonadism is diagnosed in the presence of low or normal luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone levels in women or in men with testosterone levels less than 200 nanograms per deciliter. Uh, estrogen replacement is necessary in women to prevent osteoporosis and to treat hot flesh, decreased libido and vaginal dryness. Testosterone in men may be replaced by intramuscular injection, transdermal patch or gel, like oral testosterone is not recommended. Here you see picture of schematic and uh, a photo of real patient with hypogonadism. You see on first picture it is a, a normal constitution, normal body form of a uh, man. And second schema it is a uh, man with hypogonadism uh, that can have such symptoms like uh, lack of vocal change, like narrow shoulders, high micomastias or enlarged breast. Uh, long arms and legs, it is wide hips, uh, absence of facial, uh, facial and body hair, uh, decreased muscle mass and underdeveloped uh, genitalia, like on this picture. And the same on the scheme, you see all these symptoms uh, in real photo of the man. Uh, corticotropin deficiency or ACTH deficiency. Patients with ACTH deficiency maintain mineral corticoid secretion, remember from those lectures, because aldosterone is regulated primarily by renin angiotensin system and serum potassium concentration. Symptoms include chronic malaise, fatigue, anorexia, low-grade fever, hypoglycemia and less often hyponitremia. An ACTH stimulation test and early morning plasma cortisol level measurements are initial tests. Cortisol level for secondary adrenal insufficiency or ACTH deficiency. Cortisol level less than 3 confirms adrenal insufficiency. Level more than 15 makes the diagnosis unlikely and levels in the intermediate range demands additional cosentropin stimulation test. I show you on, showed you on previous lecture. Uh, hydrocortisone replacement is necessary in doses from 15 to 20 mg per day within the highest one given in the morning. In case of an acute distress, patients should be instructed to carry a medical alert and double replacement dosage for two to three days. TSH deficiency or secondary hypothyroidism. TSH deficiency are similar to those in patients with primary hypothyroidism, including malaise, fatigue, leg cramps, dry skin, and cold intolerance. The diagnosis can't be established only through measurements of TSH because these patients might have a normal TSH level. If secondary hypothyroidism is clinically suspected, TSH and free thyroxine should be measured together. Usually patients have a low or normal TSH along with the low free T4 level. Therapy for TSH deficiency is similar to that for primary hypothyroidism. The levothyroxine replacement dose should be adjusted according to the patient's clinical status and free T4 and free T3 levels, but not TSH. If TSH deficiency or secondary hypothyroidism is clinically suspected, TSH and free T4 should be measured together. Usually patients have low or normal TSH level along with low free T4 level. Okay, uh, excess pituitary hormone secretion. The opposite situation when it is uh, excess of one of the hormones of pituitary gland or their combinations. And first that I'm going to talk about it is prolactinomas.
about the clinical uh, features. Prolactinomas are pituitary adenomas that secrete prolactin in the rate decrease and account for about 30% of all pituitary adenomas. Prolactinomas are uh, more common in women which with a peak uh, incidence during the child burning years. Clinical features related to excess prolactin, women of reproductive age mainly presents with oligomenorrhea, uh, amenorrhea, galactorrhea or infertility. Men and post-menopausal uh, women usually come to medical attention because of mass effects such as headaches and visual field defects. The majority of patients with a serum prolactin level more than 100 have prolactinoma. A serum prolactin level less than 100 in the presence of large pituitary adenoma suggests stalk compression. Uh, here you see microprolactinoma. It is a very small. It showed by arrow in a patient with primary hypothyroidism. This condition should be considered whenever prolactin levels remain elevated following normalization of TSH level and free T4. And here microprolactinoma 2 in a patient with macroprolactin anemia. Uh, this prolactinoma showed by arrow 2. Uh, after peg precipitation, prolactin recovery was low, nearly on 25%, but prolactin levels remain elevated, nearly 93 nanograms per milliliter. And here you see giant invasive pituitary prolactinoma. You see how a big, uh, even giant, can be prolactinoma that it suppresses not just chiasma and underlying structures, it press maybe the half of brain. Uh, this prolactinoma will falsely low serum prolactin. Uh, it is elevated, but by uh, but elevated by a little bit, uh, like 103 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, this uh, falsely low prolactin is due to hook effect. Uh, it rose three, uh, till uh, 13,144 nanograms after 1 to, um, one to 100 serum sam sample dilution. Here one more picture with CT scan. Uh, this diffuse pituitary enlargement, it's not adenoma, it's a diffuse enlargement of pituitary gland in patient with primary hypothyroidism induced hyperprolactin emia. First picture it is before and second picture it is after L-thyroxine replacement. You see the reduction in size of uh, this enlarged pituitary gland. Treatment of prolactinomas. Dopamine agonists are a therapy of choice for most patients and they are effective in decreasing adenoma size uh, and restoring normal prolactin level. The most common side effects include nausea, headache, dizziness, nasal congestion and constipation. Carbergulin and bromocryptin are potent inhibitors of prolactin secretion and often cause tumor sprinklage. Carbergulin is more potent and may be taken only twice a week. Surgery is reversed for patients who are intolerant or, uh, of or refractory to medical therapy. Radiation therapy may be considered for patients who poorly tolerate dopamine antagonists and cannot be cured by surgery. Uh, okay, next excess hormone uh, problem, it is acromegaly. Let's discuss clinical picture. Uh, acromegaly, it is a rare disease caused by growth hormone secreting pituitary adenoma in more than 99% of patients. Excess growth hormone before the fusion of the epiphyseal growth plates results in gigantism. Clinical features include arthralgias, a neuropathy carpal tunnel syndrome, coarsening of facial features, excessive sweating, greater hypertension, heart failure, arrhythmias, impaired glucose tolerance, microglossia, tooth gaps, pituitary mass effect, and insufficiency sensory and motor peripheral neuropathy, sleep apnea, etc. 
Acromegalic patients carry an increased risk of malignancy such as pre-malignant adenomatose colon polyps and colon cancer. Here, uh, please remember the first question uh, of our lecture. Random growth hormone levels are associated with increased morbidity and mortality if untreated. Uh, here you see uh, a clinical presentation of uh, acromegalia. The most commonly notized symptoms is abnormal enlargement of head and feet. Hands and feet. Enlargement of the feet may require increasingly larger show size. Changes in fat cell features uh, can include enlargements of forehead and jaw with a pronounced underbite spreading teeth and enlarging tongue. The nose and lips may enlarge as well. Treatment. The goal of therapy for most patients is to achieve a normal sex and age adjusted uh, IGF-1 and growth hormone less than 2 nanograms per, per milliliter. Surgery is the treatment of choice even if a uh, cure can't be achieved. Even a subtotal resection of the tumor will improve the efficiency of subsequent adjuvant therapy. Somatostatin analogs inhibit growth hormone secretion mainly by binding the somatostatin receptors and result in normalization of IGF-1 in up to 65% of patients. Uh, Pegvisumant has higher affinity to growth hormone receptors than native growth hormone, but inhibits its demerization, which is necessary for the action of growth hormone. Dopamine agonists have variable efficiency by may be an attractive first-line therapy, especially in those with co-secretion of productin and growth hormone. Uh, Cushing's disease. If previous lecture was about Cushing syndrome, like uh, primarily excess of adrenal hormones, here uh, this excess is caused by ACTH overproduction in pituitary gland. We name it Cushing disease. It comprises symptoms and signs associated with prolonged exposure of inappropriately high levels of plasma ACTH depends free glucocorticosteroids. The stria in Cushing syndrome are usually red purple, more than 1 cm wide and located on the abdomen, upper tides, wrist and arms. You remember pictures from uh, those lectures. Increased uh, skin pigmentation is rare and only occurs in the ectopic ACTH syndrome. Supraclavicular and dorsal cervical fat pads or buffalo hump showed you previous lecture and moon face are non-specific and are seen in many patients of obesity clinics. Women complain on menstrual irregularity most of uh, suffered women, nearly 84%. And hirsutism, especially uh, venous uh, hypertrichosis of face. And men and women exhibit loss of libido, namely 100% uh, of patients, nearly all. Psychiatric abnormalities occur nearly half of patients. Clinical features of Cushing disease may have the same with Cushing syndrome one more time. Uh, it is central obesity, unexplained osteoporosis, proximal myopathy, white purplish, purplish stria more than centimeters, facial plethora, spontaneous bruising, hypokalemia, serial photographs. Uh, okay, this scheme I showed you previous. Uh, previous lecture. Uh, it is a uh, prevalence of uh, different forms of Cushing syndrome, ACTH-dependent and non-ACTH-dependent. It is purple stria and uh, it is patient uh, specifically with Cushing diseases. Uh, you see here a typical stria, more than one centimeter, purple colored. And the general view of patient with uh, Cushing disease, schematically with symptoms and real woman with Cushing disease. Uh,
differential diagnosis of Cushing syndrome, those scheme I showed you previous lecture to according to level of ACTH and uh, according another test like MRI, like um, uh, CRH stimulation test, you see how to different Cushing syndrome from the Cushing disease and confirm the presence of it. Treatment of Cushing disease. Surgical removal of ACTH secreting pituitary tumor is a treatment of choice. Availability of an experienced neurosurgeon is crucial and the long-term remission rate is about 60 to 80 percent following surgery. A low or undetectable post-operative cortisol level of glucocorticosteroids is considered to be a good marker for long-term cure. Other options include reoperation and radiotherapy. Bilateral adrenalectomy is reserved for those who continue to be hypercortisolinemic. Medical therapy like ketoconazole has limited value because of uh, the associated toxicity and gradual decrease in efficiency. During therapy, liver function tests need to be closely monitored. Uh, okay, thyrotropin secreting on adenoma. Uh, TSH secreting pituitary adenoma account for less than 1% of all pituitary uh, tumors. It is quite rare, but it is possible to meet such patient. Uh, the mean age is nearly 40 years for this disorder with a slight female predominance. Symptoms secondary to hyperthyroidism and goiter are the initial complaints if the disease remains undiagnosed. The most important feature is elevation of serum T4 and T3 levels with inappropriately normal or elevated TSH level only shortly before surgery. You remember for thyroid problems, yes, it, is, it have to be negative feedback for primary problems when T3, T4 high, TSH have to be low. But if we see T3, T4 high, but TSH is normal or high, no negative feedback, uh, we suspect uh, TSH producing a pituitary adenoma. In patients with TSH secreting adenoma, surgery is the primary therapeutic approach. Radiation is generally used for those with residual tumor. Somatostatin analogs are effective for control of excess TSH production, leading possibility to a decrease in tumor size. Beta blockers should be initiated in uncontrolled hyperthyroidism. Antithyroid medications may be used only shortly. Uh, of, uh, only shortly. Uh, Non-functional and glycoprotein secreting pituitary adenomas. Uh, if they are not produced, uh, any hormones we name adenoma non-functional. Non-functional and glycoprotein secreting pituitary adenomas account for about 25 to 30 percent of all pituitary adenomas. You remember, uh, there goes on second place after prolactinomas. They are quite often. Uh, many clinically non-functional pituitary adenomas are glycoprotein producing tumors and usually manifest with the clinical features related to mass effect, including visual field effects, hypopituitarism and headache. The standard treatment for patients with mass effect is surgery, mainly through the transsphenoidal approach. Radiotherapy is indicated in patients with residual pituitary tumor following surgical debulking or in those who are not surgical candidates. The use of high-dose dopamine agonists has been associated with decrease in tumor size in only about 10% of patients. Uh, okay, uh, next disorders are quite rare. It is lymphocytic hypophysitis. A lymphocytic hypophysitis it is a rare autoimmune inflammatory lesion of the pituitary gland, commonly affecting young women during late pregnancy or in the postpartum period. Lymphocytic hypophysitis is associated with other autoimmune disorders like Hashimoto's thyroiditis and Addison's disease. You remember that it is polyglandular autoimmune attack. Other clinical manifestations uh, relate to mass effect or hypopituitarism. The corticotropin axis uh, is the most commonly affected axis in uh, this hypophysitis. 
The uh, chronologic associated with pregnancy or the postpartum period and isolated ACTH deficiency is a diagnostic clue. Transphenoidal surgery is a therapy of choice for patients with pituitary mass effect. It is important to monitor patients with varying degrees of hypopituitarism because some have recovery of their pituitary axis. Uh, next syndrome, empty cell. The empty cell is defined as a cell that, regardless of its size, is completely or partly filled with cerebrospinal fluid. On a first view, it is a danger, uh, danger condition uh, that uh, it is absence of pituitary gland. Yes, some fluid in a place of pituitary gland, maybe it is danger, but not most patients living all their life without pituitary gland uh, or with a uh, very hypertrophic pituitary gland and don't know anything about it. And really the empty cell uh, of normal size, a common incidental uh, autopsy finding. Uh, and empty cell is called secondary when it's seen after surgery, irradiation or medical treatment for a pituitary pathology. Most patients have no pituitary dysfunction, but partial or complete pituitary insufficiency had been reported, can be in such patients. The discovery on a, uh, an empty cell needs to be followed by endocrine evaluation to determine wherever there is any associated pituitary dysfunction. Management usually involves uh, reassurance and hormone replacement if it necessary, if it present deficiency. It looks like this. You see place uh, the uh, cell atrocica, the place when it have to be a uh, pituitary gland, but it nothing. It just some fluid on this place. You see it on the CT scans. Uh, pituitary apoplexy. Pituitary apoplexy it is a rare endocrine emergency resulting from hemorrhagic infarction of pre-exciting pituitary tumor. The clinical manifestations are related to rapid expansion of the tumor secondary to hemorrhage, with compression of the pituitary gland and the pericellar structures leading to headache, hypopituitarism, visual field defects, and cranial nerve pulses. Headache is the most prominent symptom in most patients with a clinically evident pituitary apoplexy. Once pituitary apoplexy is suspected, stress dose glucocorticosteroids like dexamethasone, 4 mg every 8 hours IV, should be initiated and pituitary MRI should be performed. Patients with a must effect benefit from tumor and blood clot debulking, which leads to resolution of visual field defects and in improvement of cranial nerve pulses in most patients. Uh, here you see pituitary apoplexy, uh, such it looks like on CT scan. It is apoplexy due to hemorrhagic infarction and pre of pre exciting pituitary tumor. And last uh, situation for today, diabetes insipidus. Uh, diabetes insipidus, uh, you maybe you know, it is characterized by chronic excretion of abnormally large volumes uh, of dilute urine, more than uh, 50 milliliters per kilogram. Diabetes insipidus is usually underdiagnosed because these symptoms and signs are benign and many patients ignore uh, this overurination. There are four major types of DI. It is central or neurogenic diabetes insipidus, nephrogenic DI, primary polydipsy, and gestational DI. Central DI is secondary to inadequate uh, antidiuretic hormone secretion. Diabetes insipidus results in few symptoms, including polydipsia and polyuria. Nocturia of large urine volume is often the primary reason of which patients seek medical attention. DI is not associated with any abnormality on the physical examination or routine laboratory evaluation, except at low URI osmolarity. Diagnosis. Once DM and hypercalcemia have been excluded, patients should have 24-hour urinary volume measured during uh, ad libitum fluid intake. 
DI is diagnosed in those with urinary output more than 50 ml per kilogram per day, urine osmolarity less than 300 ml osmols per kilogram and creatinine secretion, nearly 14-18 mg per kilogram body weight, as an indicator of accurate 24-hour urine collection. Measurement of spot urine osmolarity is unreliable to exclude or diagnose DI because it may be decreased significantly uh, in an otherwise healthy person who drinks large amount of water. Patients with DI who are conscious usually have sufficient thirst to maintain a normal serum sodium level in spite of polyuria. Once a diagnosis had been established, the next step is to differentiate the type of diabetes insipidus. A water deprivation test may need to be performed by an experienced endocrinologist to differentiate among types of partial DI. Uh, okay, uh, you, here you see a table of different uh, types of diabetes insipidus and uh, urine osmolarity, how to differentiate that according to urine osmolarity after fluid deprivation and after the test with desmopressin. And you see according to this osmolarity how to differentiate them all. And here uh, you see a scheme of correlation of plasma arginine vasopressin with plasma osmolarity in normal subjects in patients who have central or pituitary diabetes insipidus and in those who have, uh, who have a probable nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And you see that uh, nephrogenic causes line upper and pituitary uh, have more low number of uh, plasma arginine levels and plasma osmol higher, higher level of plasma osmolarity. Therapy of diabetes insipidus. The treatment of choice for central diabetes insipidus is intranasal synthetic replacement for vasopressin, like desmopressin acetate, at doses of 2, 5 to 20 micrograms daily. Central diabetes insipidus has responded to chlor chlorpropamide with 25 to 75 reduction in polyurea. Oral uh, repletion of water often is sufficient to reverse acute dehydration in diabetes insipidus. There are no effective pharmacologic agents to treat or compulsive water drinker. A low osmolar low sodium diet should be initiated to manage congenital nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The therapy of choice for central diabetes insipidus is the administration of uh, antidiuretic hormone analog desmopressin. It is available in subcutaneous form or as an oral or nasal spray. The spray or oral form of desmopressin is usually started at bedtime and is gradually titrated for the desired antidiuretic effect. And test 4 for you for today. A 45-year-old female uh, undergoes a transphenoidal approach for epituitary prolactinoma. Surgery proceeded without complications and the entire mass was removed. The patient's urine output is 4 liter on post-operative day 1 and labs are significant for serum natrium uh, of 145 mL per liter. Normal level is 135 by 145. Urine osmolarity is 185 mL and urine specific gravity is 1004. Which of the following choices is the next best step? First, it is water restriction. Second, loop diuretic. Third, CT scan of the brain. Uh, fourth, it is 0.45% uh, natrium chloride administered I administration IV and desmopressin. Prognosis and prophylaxis of hypothalamic pituitary diseases. Many causes of hypothalamic dysfunction are treatable. Most of the time, missing hormones can be replaced. And uh, for today, that's all. I hope this lecture was interesting and include a different, uh, a lot of different situation. But most of them, uh, we discussed on previous lecture and. Uh, uh, the problems with regulation, problems with hypothalamic pituitary system uh, lead 
to the same clinical picture that we discuss on lecture about thyroid gland, on lecture about adrenal gland, on lecture about diabetes. Uh, that's why I, I think that today's lecture, like problems with regulation, just systematize your knowledges about different endocrine pathologies. And for today, that's all. Here we finish a uh, cycle of lectures about endocrine system. Uh, and uh, next lecture we start another system. I hope it was interesting. If you have as usual difficult moments, if you have questions, you can always write it in the comments under the video and in our Facebook page. Uh, and as usual, I ask all students who listen in me to uh, uh, who listen in me uh, to write your name and group in comments under the video. Uh, for today, that's all. See you in one week. Goodbye.